yes. I took that earlier. Okay, right? which ones? Okay, yeah. Stephanie and Matthew from University of Southern California and the Baltimore County Public Schools. We have music for them? I can't hear the music from Wave up here. It's going? There we go. That's it. That's what we're talking about. That's what, that, what, what, what? He's sending me off the stage. All right, Stephanie. Matt. Do we need mics or we're good with that? Thanks. Okay, we have two uh, main objectives with this design. The first is to improve outcomes for all students, both academic and non-academic. Uh, so research has shown that consequential accountability systems have been successful in raising student achievement, so our proposal continues in that vein. But also one of the criticisms of NCLB was that it focused almost exclusively on test scores and ignored other uh, outcomes of schools that we know are important and that we value, so we included some non-academic outcomes. Our second objective is fairness, and this is fairness to teachers and schools. Um, so we try to avoid any measures that are correlated with student demographics. Okay. All right. So our first indicator of performance is an achievement measure, and this makes two improvements upon NCLB. First, we're looking at all tested subjects, not just math and English language arts. And second, we're giving schools for credit for all students along the continuum, and not just those students right around the state's proficiency cutoff. We do this by transforming students' scores on the state assessments to a 0 to 100 scale. And then we take that and we create a measure of how the student on average is doing in this school. And then we also look at the subgroup performance. And in this measure, we're actually accounting for different sizes in subgroups, making sure that um, one school isn't necessarily held for a subgroup that is very small when the performance of another subgroup is much, much different. Our second measure of performance is a growth measure. We're basing this off of some research that I actually think was published at Fordham or with Fordham, that looks at a two-step value-added model. And this model is strong because it actually eliminates the relationship between student demographics and what schools are contributing to a, school's, uh, or to a student's learning. We do this growth measure for all grades and subjects for which we can calculate a growth score. And then we report it again for the whole school and as a subgroup measure. Two other things we're looking at are English language learners, and we're giving credit for two things. One, improvement in proficiency over time, and the reclassification rates of students too proficient. And then we have another uh, system of indicators for school and student success, and we're looking at five things. Absenteeism, a survey of student engagement, disciplinary rates, on-time grade promotion to grades following elementary school, as well as then um, access to a full curriculum, which includes all of the core <laughs> subjects, as well as then physical education and the arts. So while we do not propose to have a single rating, whether we have, uh, instead, sorry, we have four ratings here, and each are from a scale of zero to 100. Uh, with the exception of the ELs category, they are an average of the whole school rating and subgroups rating. The achievement and growth ratings would be used to identify low-performing schools, while the ELs and other categories would be used to diagnose problems or target interventions for these low-performing schools. Okay. Well done. Well done. Round of applause. Round of applause. Okay, very nicely done. I'm going to start with Tony. I know he has a question about the two-step VAM. I've seen you do the two-step VAM, Tony, uh, in your cowboy boots. You're very good. I do it. I do it to that uh, that song. What did the What does the gad fly say? <laughs> yes, good. Good answer. Google that one too if you don't know about it. Okay, Tony. What I just want to know that's going to be the lead in music. So you know, I again preferring um, preferring S student growth percentiles. I find VAM trying to talk about it with educators, trying to talk about it with people to be a black box. So how do you take a black box and then make a two-tiered black box out of it? So the research that we're using, they look at student growth percentiles as well. They also look at a one-step value-added model. And the reality is that they provide similar information. The difference is that what the two-step does is it removes all of that correlation, right? The relationship between a student's background characteristics and what a school is contributing. So yes, it's much more technical, I get that, but the idea is that it's able to sort of el elicit just what a school is doing for particular students. One last thing, Mike, if I may, you seem to have what I would consider to be a really heavy, heavy weight on what I consider to be non-academic factors. And, and I think we are now in an era where we're trying to thread that needle. Um, I, I think 
I'm a little concerned that you may have gone overboard to the non-academic side. Could a a well-rounded curriculum that's not academic? Is that, is that what I, I didn't say that. Right. <laughs> Just want to make that clear. Right. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. And, and again, you had, the, you had the issue with attendance as well, trying to define attendance. So, but go ahead. So just for clarity, you're asking, you think we are too much on academics and not oh, enough? No, non-academics. Oh. I, I, I thought there was some, you know, some not, unless I read it wrong. Sure. So achievement and growth are the two measures that we're using to identify the lowest performing schools. So they are still heavily driven by academics. But we're using those other indicators of performance to identify where schools need interventions and supports for improvement that will then help those things like achievement and growth in the future. Okay. See, Tony's a simpleton, so he just he missed that. that, that, that I, must have, I must have gotten through, went over my head. Yeah, right, just kidding. Uh, Joanne? And also for Tony's benefit, um, <laughs> you don't have an A through F or any similar combined score. Um, so you end up with four different scores, and oh, you expect people to be able to look at four things and figure out what they mean. I personally think that's not crazy, but can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> Sure. So we didn't combine the measures because we didn't want to mask one particular area by high performance or low performance in another. And so by providing a 0 to 100, which research says the public can understand what a 0 to 100 means, we're providing them a full scope of what is happening in a school. And we think that people at minimum are smart enough to look at four numbers and sort of say, oh, they're doing great in a growth measure, but they maybe need some help in areas like English language proficiency. And then you're just using on your chart, it would be the first two, the gold and the green, are the two that are used to figure out which schools are low performing and require interventions, and the other two are used to, to identify what those interventions diagnose problems and figure out what the interventions ought to be in that particular school. Correct. Unless the English learners are particularly low, in which case. Also correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you both very much. Stephanie and Matthew, great job. We're going to do our voting. Now, I, I am biased on this point. I do like this idea of saying we can handle more than one rating. Parents, we, you know, we get report cards. We get, what, you know, five or six different grades at once. We can handle it. Even Tony's dad can handle yeah, it. Yeah, he, he, he always appreciated my report card. All right. <laughs> we, we'd like to hear about that report card sometime. OK, the voting is open. It looks like it is working. How are we doing? A lot of love -its. Many, many love uh, this time around. Not too many think it would be illegal. Interesting. Uh, let me ask a quick, quick question. I, I put Joanne on the spot again because you've been most recently in the department. This idea of using scale scores instead of proficiency rates, you think that, that counts? That would be OK? The language in the law mentions of academic achievement indicators of proficiency or something like that. Yeah, but I think the way they did the achievement thing ac accomplishes that. OK. All right. All right, Tony, let's start with you. So I, I have to say I liked it after. And I, I would tell you I liked it after your explanations. Your explanations were excellent. I think you 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 answered the questions, and I think if, you know I, I was trying to, as I've said before, I was trying to view this as you were presenting this to a community or a school, and and I think you did an outstanding job presenting how that would work. So I liked it. Okay, Charlene. I'm in the Levitt category. Um, this is one of the proposals with your explanation that kind of hit all of my particular uh, framework pieces. Um, and the other reason I'd really like to advocate for loving it um, is that if any of this gets taken to more conversations, I think it will benefit the whole. I love, as a school leader, um, having something that's more complicated and comprehensive than just here's your watered down, don't really know what it means score. OK, excellent. So keep, keep those individual ratings. By the way, uh, the department, that's one thing they may have to figure out, is do you require states to mush all these indicators together into a single rating or not. Uh, they could uh, implement, uh, they could probably interpret the law that way, but maybe they don't have to. Joanne? Yeah, I'm in the Levitt category as well. I particularly liked the non-academic indicators, like the specific non-academic indicators that were picked here, I thought were really interesting. So for those of you who haven't read it, it's things like student engagement and happiness. Like, who doesn't like that? And um, <laughs> there's an equity measure. There's an opportunity to learn measure. So there's some really good metrics in here that I think are worth looking at. OK. Andy? So I am barely in the like it, but a strong like it category. Uh, 
the stuff that uh, two things I want to just point out particularly good. Uh, this idea of the zero to one hundred um, uh, transforming like these proficiency rates and like the bands into this very intuitive way, uh, both so people can understand it, but then also so you can measure growth of all students is great. Also, this idea of not having a summative A through F grade, at least a summative total one at the end, have summative for various categories, uh, fantastic. But one concern or something that I would like to talk more, hear more about, is whether or not state departments of education really ought to get into the business of determining what a rich curriculum for every school in the state is. Um, having worked at one of these, I'm not sure that the State Department of Education is the best uh, organization to do that. I'm not sure who is. And this gets into the realm of inputs. Um, are these central administrators, should they be going that far into the details of what is happening in every single class? Uh, I'm not totally worried about it, but it's worth thinking about. All right. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for...